Dave put that in the chat. David Pop or Dave somebody else? I don't know. It just says Dave. <laughs> Dave, thank you, Dave. Um, Welcome to CalFlora Tools for CNPS users, specifically Redbud. If you're not a California Native Plant Society member, that's okay. And if you're not a Redbud member, that's okay. This presentation is geared toward that particular region of the state of California. Um, so you might see more plants if you're familiar with that, more plants that you're familiar with if you're from that part of the state. But if you're not, that's totally fine. And there is someone moderating the chat. Who's moderating the chat? Is that Chrissy? Yes. So Chrissy is moderating the chat. If you have a question, um, please ask it on chat or out loud. There are a lot of people on the call, so um, it's probably better on chat. And then if it's urgent, she will um, find a good point to interject and ask the question. What is Calflora? It's a 501c3 nonprofit plant database. We provide information on wild California plants for conservation, education, and appreciation. Here is the team. I have an MS in GIS, which is Geographic Information Science. So that's a database type background. I've been working at CalFlora since 2013. And before that, I was at California Invasive Plant Council. So I'm getting to be familiar with plants, but I'm not a botanist. Um, and then here's the rest of the team. And there's a lot of dedicated volunteers who participate in CalFlora um, remotely even. So if you're interested in volunteering and spending as much or little time on CalFlora, improving the website, making some changes, maybe with photos, reference photos, do let us know. We welcome volunteers. We had in May our sixth annual photo contest and I know May was a couple months ago, but I just have to show you these photos because they're so beautiful. And there's first place, second place and third place and then another just entry photo. We had, I think, I don't know, thou, thou, like over a thousand photos submitted this year. And it was very close um, and it was a fun contest. So if you're interested in participating next year, you should. Um, the CalFlora database contains 10,000 native and introduced species. That's all parent and child species in the state of California that are wild. Of those 10,000, we have over 2 million plant location observations, points, lines, and polygons. Um, the lines and polygons are, would be, does anybody want to hazard a guess on chat as to why you might use a line or a polygon for a plant? For, for a plant observation? Transects, Alina is guessing transects. Yeah, that would be a great example. So if you're doing a transect to show an area, says Denise also, right? So if you have a whole area and Senpai says um, population of plants, and Carissa says to cover a larger area when, when there's too many, right? It would take a long time to do point after point after point of the same species for a big area. So you can do like Kern says, a colony or an area or some acres and say within that area. Oh gosh, I have to do it again. Sorry, you guys. Um, oh, this is a better view. I can see who's not muted. Mute, mute. Okay, I think that did it. Um, it's an efficient and better way to track where something is if there's a lot of it, like acres and acres of it. And we do have a, something I'm not gonna talk a lot about tonight called Weed Manager, which is what uh, land managers oftentimes use to track any treatments or um, work that they're doing with invasive plants. And polygons are just a really fast way to keep track of what it is that you're doing in the field. We have over 30,000 relationships between old and new plant names. As you know, for better or for worse, plant names do change over time. And um, when those changes happen, you might not really, you know, you learned it with a different name. Sorry, trying to mute everybody. Um, then if you're searching for an old name or an old, old name, you can find it still crosswalk to or connected to the current name, whatever the current name might be. 
And that way, um, you don't have to know yourself what the current name is for the new mimulus that you're interested in, um, but you can use Calflora and search for any name and find them all in the same place and say, here are some alternate names or synonyms for this species. Over 300,000 plant photos. A lot of those do come from your observations, David Pop, and other people's observations. I'm gonna show you a few later in this presentation. Some also come from Cal Photos, which is part of the UC system. And it gets complicated because people think then we're part of the UC system, Cal, Flora, Cal, UC, but really we're separate, we're a nonprofit and we serve the um, Cal Photos photos. We have over 80,000 unique Cal Flora e-visitors each month. And recently in, during the COVID that's been going up. Um, and we have about 4,000 active data contributors. And I'm hoping that you will all be interested in contributing your wild plant photos and your wild plant surveys um, at the end of this presentation. The Calflora database contains all 10,000 native and introduced plant species, all wild plant species in the state, and we are a data clearinghouse so that we include not just native, so-called native Calflora observations, of also invasive plants, but that people enter directly into Calflora. But we also have CCH, California Consortium of Herbarium, which is um, specimen pre press. If you use a plant press, press the um, specimen, the plant specimen, and then submit it to your local herbarium. We include that. And then also some filtered iNaturalist data. Um, and we can. I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about iNaturalist later in my presentation. Oh, as important as what Calflora is, what is Calflora not? Um, we're not part of the UC system. We do not receive any financial support from the UC system. We're not part of Calphotos. They are part of the UC system. We're not part of Calypsi, which is the California Invasive Plant Council. Um, and we are not part of CNPS, which is another nonprofit, just like Calypsi is its own nonprofit. So we're Calypsi, CNPS, and Calflora are their own nonprofits. Cal Photos and the UC are totally separate. And um, Calflora does not receive UC funding. We're our own 501c3 since 2000. And this is our 20 year anniversary. And if you can see me in the video, I'm wearing our 20th anniversary t shirt, which you can get if you donate. Um, and on the back, it says Calflora also. Big birthday year. Um, and Christy was asking more about the funding from UC. Christy, as far as I know, Calflora has not received funding from UC since 2013. John, was it different before that? You might be muted. What, what happened in 2013? Well, I joined Calflora, so that's what I know about. But before oh. that, I don't know. <laughs> of course. <laughs> but before that, I, there wasn't, there might have been like a small, so there, there was a period where uh, Calflora and Calphotos were hosted out of the same <laughs> UC digital library project. Um, even then, the then executive director, Ann Dennis, had to do funding to pay for people. Um, the, at that point, Calflora was hosted on UC servers, um, and there were p and there were people working on Calflora out of UC offices. I believe that ended in 2001 completely. So. Okay. So this is our 20 year anniversary. So today I'm gonna to talk about Calflora taxon report pages, map layers, the planting guide, entering photos into Calflora. And then at the very end, not all of you might wanna stay for part five, but we are really interested in getting chapter surveys and checklists into Calflora. It makes Calflora data much more robust to have chapter checklists in there. San Luis Obispo took this on after um, my presentation to them a few months ago. And they've now entered mm, dozens of surveys uh, over thousands of acres in San Luis Obispo. And it, you know, search, you know, if you're searching for what plants grow in what regions in San Luis Obispo, it's so much more thorough now, thanks to them. And so I'm hoping, I know that Hannah and Shane are interested and a few more of you said maybe on the, um, on the RSVP. So if you are interested, that'll be at the end because I know not everybody's interested, although I think it's fascinating. Here are our popular taxon report pages. Here's an example of one for California huckleberry. 
Um, there's one taxon report page for each wild plant species in the state of California, and it contains so much information and lots of hyperlinks and everything you might want to find out about a plant is somewhere on this page. Even if you need to know about pests and pathogens associated with those species, you can find that here also. Um, do you see my mouse when I do that here? Or do you not see my mouse? Yes. Okay, yeah, you good. See it. So you can see that. Great. I'm going to talk about different parts of the taxon report pages. These reference photos come from people like you. Um, thank you very much. So there, once you add an observation to CalFlora, we have about 20 volunteers who go through and choose the best ones from the selection and the accurate ones. Sometimes there's a not accurate one, in which case we can, um, you can comment on it. I can talk more about that later. But if you have a good photo of a species, it might be chosen to be a reference photo here on the taxon report page. And then you are officially famous. Um, here, for example, Raylan, am I saying that right? Raylan Noel, um, is her photo was chosen to be part of this Pine Hill flannel bush taxon report page. I trimmed down some of the parts of the taxon report page just so this slide wouldn't be so busy, but um, it shows the distribution of the species. These yellow squares are one or more, one or more occurrences within a 7.5 minute quadrangle. So within these quads, someone has also found it. And then you can scroll down and look through all the beautiful photos submitted by Raylan and other people. Cynthia, In term can, yes. Ken asks a question. About copyright. Do you automatically copyright a photo I might submit? You have choices um, when you decide to register as a data contributor with CalFlora, you can decide to, um, that we have a Creative Commons license, you can choose that says for non-commercial use, um, this photo may be used, we have a CalFlora license, so it can only be used within CalFlora, and you decide how you, if and how you want your photos to be used within CalFlora. Thanks, Karen, that was a good question. Here's Kit Davenport's photo, I'm hoping Kit might be listening on this call also. Um, for the Carolina bugbane. And here these blue dots show the distribution of the species. This one down here looks a little bit suspect. Um, if we were live on the CalFlora website, we could click on this county and see what exactly is going on. Is that an old record? Was it really here a long time ago? Is it a maybe a California Consortium of Herbarium record where the location accuracy isn't so good and actually doesn't really belong there? Um, and then you can click through any of these and see more details about those observations for those species. You can scroll through photos. You can look at the plant distribution in more detail. Um, observation search, see all the observations, 53 for this species, and then plant characteristics. I'll get more into plant characteristics in a minute. Oh, no, Noel, thank you, Noel. Trifolium here with a photo by Cheryl, who I think is on this call also, beautiful photo. And then another one by Diane. And so they're famous. Here is a not native species. And sometimes people say, oh no, <laughs> don't, you shouldn't have those on your website. But the thing is, is that non-natives exist in California and that's a fact. So if they're gonna exist, we might as well know a lot about them so that we can figure out what to do if anything. Um, if they're invasive, how invasive are they? And Calypsi is rating uh, the non-native species in the state to decide which ones should get the most attention. So if it's something that's non-native, it is noted here. And if it's rated by Calypsi, there's a hyperlink over to Cal the California Invasive Plant Council. Just another layer of information about every single wild plant species in the state, including photos. Here's Karen Swift's checker lily, gorgeous photo again and the distribution of that species. Plant characteristics I mentioned a minute ago and let's just look at what that might be for this checker lily. Every species has tolerances, what elevation, between which elevations it can survive, what precipitation it needs, temperature, soil affinity, serpentine affinity, pH, etc. So we have all this information within CalFlora that you can look at like this. And then it's also contained in our algorithms when you're wondering, is something going to grow well at this specific location? Well, what is the elevation of that location? What is the salinity of the soil? What is the calcium carbonate in the soil? 
what is the temperature ranges that the plant can tolerate and that are at that location. So you can either look at it as information like this, or you can look at it as, I want to plant something at a specific location, what's going to grow well there? That is our planting guide. I'm going to talk about that too. Yeah, I'll get also to where the redbud chapter is exactly. It's, um, it's two counties combined for those of you who aren't part of redbud. Here is- Oh, uh, excuse me. Yeah. Oh, sorry, two <laughs> count counties <laughs> combined, not chapters. Yep. Since you said that you wanted questions uh, as you went along, yes. uh, someone asked, what's the data source of the tolerance information? If that's an easy question, otherwise- Of the tolerance, sure. Yeah, otherwise someone could email you later if, you, if they want detailed information. Well, luckily John's on this call. Let me pass that question over to you, John. You might be muted, by the way. Um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's basically just analyzing our observation data, but it, it's actually analyzing the observation data that has a, a, a high enough accuracy. So it's, it's actually for, to get the soil characteristics, it's a lot higher because the soil polygons that we get from NRCS are really small. The climate characteristics are, are a little bit easier. Um, but if some if some record has a accuracy of two kilometers, it it's not usable for either one. So it, it's really it's like the the smartphone applications where they they have a an accuracy of ten meters. Those those are really useful for generating tolerances. D does that answer the question? Uh yeah. Well, enough for now. Maybe Alina and Gail and Kern could um. We could follow up on that later. Yeah, if, if you see, uh, if you look at one of the pages that shows the tolerances, if it's less than 50, there's a great big warning. If, if, in other words, if we don't have 50 points for either climate or soil, it, it's like, you know, this is probably too narrow. I just wrote that down. So we'll show the plant okay. characteristics and the tolerances for, for a species when we're looking at the planting guide, and then you guys will understand better where it comes from. Every taxon report page has a scientific name, the author or authors here, oops, and the, and the common name or names. And if you don't like one of the common names, let us know and we can change it or add another one. There are also some not PC common names that we've been getting rid of. Um, note the family, genus, subspecies, and varieties. So for every, for this species, there are one, two, three, four varieties, and they each have their own taxon report page. And you can click here. If you were live on the website, you could click on anyone and see the varieties for the sand aster. Note the native status. This one is not native. And here's the hyperlink to the California Invasive Plant Council to learn more about um, its rating, which is high. And then also for non-natives uh, invasives, we have quadrangle data. So these little red quads represent that it exists somewhere in this quad. We don't know exactly where. Similar to the yellow ones that we were looking at earlier for rare species indicate that it's somewhere in this quadrangle, but we don't know where. And then the bloom wheel, of course, more photos, the family, the genus, we talked about the genus. Alternate names. This has gotten, there were, John just completed um, a lot, I think 50 or 75 um, crosswalk of alternate names to new names, change names, updated names, and whatever the species is. So for this aster, if you, I'm not, I can't even pronounce the, the new name, but if you were looking for it under one of the older names, the alternate names, the synonyms, you would still find it here and end up land on this taxon report page. We also have wetland information and community information down here um, below. Nursery availability, if you're hoping to buy something, you can look at which nurseries sell it and where they're located now during the COVID you would have to check and see if they're open or how, how exactly that might work. But um, that we're gonna get into also, I'm gonna write that down when we go into the planting guide. So for instance, for this particular species, here are the nursery and seed sources where it was available 
recently. We don't know during the COVID. And then you can click on the, here and, and go to that source and learn more. Okay, so any questions about CalFlora taxon report pages before we move on to map layers? Um, there, there was a question there um, on the that page on the California Aster. It didn't there, I guess. It it does. So I scrolled down to um, this is Christy's question. I scrolled down to show the more information about it. So it does still have the photos and the Cal Photos link on here. It's just that I, in order to make it fit on the screen, I had to cut out the whole top part of the page. Okay, so any other questions before we move on to the map layers? Okay, map layers. Here's one of our newer map layers, Serpentine. It's so beautiful. And you can query, cut the database to see which plants grow in these serpentine areas and to see which species have serpentine affinity. You'd think that those are probably correlated. And, um, Another layer we have is watersheds and we also have sub watersheds. So if you're doing research or interested in a particular watershed, you can, instead of drawing that crazy line around the watershed yourself, you can just turn on map layers and um, query by specific watershed. I'm gonna just write map layer because that's something that we need to do live so you guys can see how to do it. Precipitation, beautiful of course. Um, and this is, as I mentioned before, with the plant characteristics and the tolerances derived from the precipitation information that we have for the state of California and actually a little bit farther outside the state here. We also, my favorite layer is protected areas. They look, they look stuck together here because it's the whole state, but if you zoom in or drill down into a smaller area, like we'll look at the red bud chapter, you can see that each pastel outline is a, its own protected area. And so, you know, national parks, forests, county parks, state parks um, have their own outline. And you can say, I want to know what grows within this state park. And then you don't have to draw a polygon around it. You can just say, turn on that layer, what grows here, and then create your illustrated plant list. Um, and yep. Uh the serpentine oh, question. You're going to explain to people how they access the layers, right? Yes, I'm going to show you how to do that. And then someone asked about serpentine. The purple, blue, red stands for how old that layer is. So Mesozoic, Paleo, something or other. And that's all, um, all the information about the layers and where they come from and how did we derive them is, um, I'll show you where that is and it's all on the CalFlora website. They are wicked, aren't they? Somebody wrote wicked, that's a good word for them. CNPS chapters, of course. So if you wanna look at your specific CNPS chapter, which I did to um, create, I think you saw that in the, one of the opening slides that Redbud had was showing your exact chapter, plus a lot of dots in it. Might've been since 2015, all the observations within your chapter were there. So um, that's available. And I'll show you live when we go to the CalFlor website. I'm a little bit afraid to get to exit out of my presentation to go live because I'm afraid that the uh, screen share thing won't work again. So I'm going to go through the entire static presentation. And I, and so uh, that's for you. I mean, I for Jasmine and I, somebody. that's for you and Lonnie. Hold on, Lonnie, whoever that okay. is. Yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. where's the mute? Mm -hmm. All right, let's go on to the planting guide. Oh, you know, for the planting guide, I was gonna exit out also. Well, I think it I think it should work. Let me just try it. Can you see, do you see calflora.org homepage now? Yes. Yes, great. Yeah, so, so yeah, just remember the control S if you need to get back. All oh, right, that's right. <laughs> Dave, the mysterious Dave. <gasps> oh no. All right, I hope that goes away, that sound. So here we are, calflora.org homepage. Let me make it a little bit smaller. I am signed in as me. So the preferences that I have set up are for my, per, you know, like the where I live, the maps will center there, stuff like that. I'm going to click on the planting guide and let's go. So Redbud chapter is in Nevada and Placer counties combined. So let's go over to 
those two counties. And then I would like somebody, you don't have to give me an address. I mean, you can give me an address if you want to, but maybe like a street within a town within um, your chapter where we could look and see what native plants grow well at that location. So I want some location within the Redbud area. Anybody want to type it in? And we can do a couple, we can do I can one. I give you my uh, street. Yeah, that's fine. Mount Vernon Road, Auburn. Was that you, Peggy? Oops. Mount Vernon Road, Auburn. All right, is that close, uh, Peggy? All right, so let's assume it's right about here. Is it low water? Is it riparian and is it shady? It was obviously not gonna be low water and riparian. So is it one or the other? And is it shady? Peggy. Maybe Peggy, can you unmute for a second? Yes, that would low be water. Like if the person is looking for shade plants or looking for low water plants. Right, okay. So Peggy, are you looking for low water plants? I'm looking for shade plants. Shade plants, okay. And what about riparian or low water? Um, no riparian. Um, it's 25 acres. So uh, if I'm thinking of my backyard, it's deep shade. Okay, should I have low water checked or no? Um, it's irrigated. Okay, so I don't need to check that. Um, let's really constrain it by checking all of these. So this, the results are gonna be only within the same county, only within 10, also only within 10 miles. Use soil factors to choose plants, omit plants at the edge of their tolerances and easy to establish. If we don't have enough in our results, we can um, change our constraints. Let's see, 92 plants and let's not group by life farm. So let's fold up the map here so we can scroll through these. So for Peggy's location, these would grow well according to the plant tolerances um, that we have for them. And these are of course only gonna be native plants. And if you wanna know more about the species like the Ceanothus, you can go to the taxon report page for it. Look through more photos. We have the bloom period. If you would like to know uh, where to find it, which nurseries sell it, CNPLX stands for California Native Plant Link Exchange. You can click on that. And here we have a list of nursery and seed sources for the Ceanothus, and then also a few outside of California. And location suitability. Because for this Ceanothus, we know that it tolerates between 100 to 2200 meters, and this location value is at 376 meters. That's one of the reasons why it showed up in these search results. Precipitation 15 to 99 works for this plant. This location is 35 inches. And here we go for soil. Um, so that is one example of the planting guide. And under tools here, what I like to do, you can download it as a spreadsheet. You can send it as an email. And here's, you can turn on the location profile here to actually just see what we were just looking at in the same view there. Um, and then there's a video about how to use a planting guide. There's help and you can go to what grows here. So then this shows all the species that grow at this particular location. And the planting guide is the native ones that would grow well here according to um, these criteria that we checked. And Let's see, Crystal Wells, Nevada City. Let's try that. Uh, let's go back to the home page here by clicking on the sunflower. Go back into the planting guide. Okay, so who is this? This is Avenel Tomlinson, Crystal Wells, Nevada City. Here yes. are your species. Fold up the map. Scroll through. Oh, this is pollinator species, the arrow with the butterflies there. Um, oh, now I've lost you. Oh. 
Hang on, hang on. I can get you back there. Okay. Your mute's not on. Okay. And if you wanted to tighten that up, if 236 plants is really too many to even get your head around, then we'll say easy to establish, omit plants at the edge of their tolerances, use the soil factors to choose the plants, et cetera. So that narrowed it down quite a bit. Less, so 105. Mm -hmm. Um, and you could print this, you could share it. So if you take this exact URL, this link, and you do control C, copy and paste it. Um, like I'll just do this into the chat. Um, then you can all see the exact same query with the exact same results that I did. All right, any questions about the planting guide? Uh, this is, this is um, one of the questions that I think has come up uh, in general is um, what accounts for the difference between um, what Cal Flora maps and what Calscape maps showing mm -hmm. us whether a particular species is, species is local to some specific area. Mm -hmm. And and what should we do in response to this if if we're native plant gardeners who who want to plant plant you know local natives? Mm -hmm. Well, the main difference between um, the planting guide, Calflora's planting guide, and Calscape is that we are using Calflora observations to know what species grow in a certain location, and Calscape is using herbaria observations. Do we also use herbaria, John, or just the Calflora? We use the herbaria that are of sufficient location accuracy. Right, because a lot so, of the you know 1800, early 1900s records, right. the location accuracy is really low. So we don't use those, but so we use some CCH records and then also Calflora records and um, Calscape just uses the CCH records. <laughs> and what's really interesting is to take these results and compare them to Calscape at the exact same location, just see how the results are different. And then you guys know a lot, you know, how could the results on the planting guide be improved? Could the results on Calscape be improved? How do they compare? Maybe they are identical, I, I doubt it. Um, and just, you know, send us your feedback because that's actually really helpful to us. And Mike was asking, can you also select for the size or habitat of the plant, ground cover, shrub, et cetera? Um, here, so Mike, there's this plus. Oh yeah, now you see it. So here, if you just want shrubs, here are all the shrubs. When we were, um, oh, we're in what grows here. Well, in the planting guide, it's the same. So you can open up and see just the shrubs. And if you group it by uh, life form, then, then that goes away. I wanted to show you the map layers while I'm on the Calflora website before going back to the presentation. And here we are in, in what grows here. So every map in Calflora has this layers above it. You open it up and you can turn on county lines. So you can see Nevada and Placer County lines. You can turn on streams within region. Here's the sea pad that I mentioned, the California protected areas. Let's just back out a little bit so I can see this better. And then if you, oh, this one's Spenceville Wildlife Area. So if you wanted to know what plants grow in Spenceville Wildlife Area without drawing that funny polygon around the area, you could say within the selected background, what grows here? And then I like to um, create illustrated plant lists so Spenceville Wildlife Area in Nevada County, um, you can decide if you want no photos. Of course, I do want photos. Group by family, order by bloom start month, no photos, show display, show photo links. So let's turn that off because I like it the way it is. And then you can print this and bring it with you when you go hiking and try and find some things you might not have found. You can also um, turn on the points. If you want to see exactly where these species grow, you can turn them on here. Um, you can really spend a lot of time in what grows here with a lot of fun things, playing around with a lot of fun features, including these layers. Now, if you want to look at some other layers, you can look at CNPS chapter. So here we are in Redbud in these two counties right there. Um, the Jepson E flora, Jepson region, 
zip code, eco region, watershed. I love the watersheds. So there they are. And if you zoom in, you get sub watersheds. And if you zoom out, you get bigger watersheds. Grid, quadrangle, quarter quadrangle, climate. You can look at the climate information on this map, soil information on this map. And then you can make your polygons, you know, darker background there. Ooh, that's nice, huh? Yeah. So, and you can go full screen and. I know, I told you. Okay, so I have to figure out how to mute people again. Uh, I'm really sorry, I forgot how to do this. Oh, here we go. Okay, somebody talking about lunch needs to be muted, right? Um, all right, so that's layers and then the planting guide again from the homepage, planting guide, and then you type in an address or a cross street or something close by to where you're interested in, in planting and see what results you get. Are there any questions about the planting guide or map layers before I go back to the static presentation? Are blooming months also based on collected observations in Calflora? Asks Matt, Matthew. Um, no. John, where do blue months come from? Um, there, when the gypsum flora has it, that's definitely our starting values. Sometimes we expand them a little bit with respect to by looking at either CalFlora observations or photos on CalPhotos. Um, so it, it can be really misleading for, for a plant that grows statewide, like a, a what the, well, I'm forgetting. It, 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 the blueing months in San Diego County might be really different than Del Norte County. So, you know, for, for plants with really wide ranges, um, the tendency is to, to bracket the whole thing, which might not be useful at any particular place, so. And I do see that some people are asking questions about uploading and, and yeah, like I think Tom said, let's, let's wait until we get to the upload section, which is coming soon. In fact, I think it's next. Now let's see if I have to do anything special or if this just works. Cynthia? Yes. Uh, Francis asks, is there a selection for bulbs? The geophyte. I don't think so, John. Uh, no. No. Okay. If you don't live in California or live in an urban area, can you just enter the climate and soil parameters of your site and generate a planting list? Good question. Rather than putting in an address or region, that's Josephine, who I think goes by Josie. Do you go by Josie or is that a different Josie? Mm -hmm. John, do you want to, do you want to, answer that question? Um, no, it, you know, it's theoretically possible. And I think in an early interface, we tried that. Um, so there, there's a application called advanced search for plants. Yeah. So what you could do is you could put in a pH and um, a rainfall and, and like that and see what plants that no matter where you are, what plants fit in those, the, your criteria. Um, that may still work. I honestly don't remember. Uh, so, <laughs> And if John doesn't know, ain't nobody going to know. <laughs> okay, here's the planting guide link again. Audience, so, so we did that. Now we're going to talk about entering photos into CalFlora. <laughs> again, some beautiful photos from our photo contest. Even if it's not May, you can still enter beautiful photos into CalFlora, and they might be chosen as reference photos. Um, here is our multiple photo upload, which you get to, let's see, well, I'll show you, I'll show you how you get to that um, when I go back to the website. And you can also use Observer Pro, which is our phone app on iPhone or Android, to add observations and photos to CalFlora. David Pop is a prolific user, Hannah's been using it, um, a bunch of you, Kit, I think. Karen, um, so Observer Pro, if you have a smartphone, which I know not everybody does, but if you have one and you usually have it with you, so you don't have to remember to bring it with you. And then when you're out in the field, you can take a picture. And even if you don't know the species, you can take a bunch of pictures, upload it to CalFlora. And then we have a group called Plant ID Help Group that can help you ID the plant. Um, if you can get it down to the genus, 
then they see the genus and the location and they'll help you get to the species level. Or you can just leave it as totally unknown and take really, really good photos. Um, and that group can help you. I'll show you. I'll show you that group when we go on the website again. And um, Observer Pro is free and you do need to be a registered data contributor to use it. That's what I was hoping everybody would do before this meeting tonight was register in the upper right of the Calflora homepage as a data contributor so that you can add your wild plant photos to Calflora. Cause you can use Calflora to help you identify plants to figure out what to plant in your garden. You can use it in a lot of ways and then you can give back by putting your photos in. If you would like to obscure Observer Pro, Calflora Observer Pro, uh, Teresa, I think it's both either. If you look up Observer Pro and there's multiple, pick the Calflora one. If you want to upload rare plants into the Calflora database and you're worried about somebody mm, pilfering or you know cutting them or destroying them to develop the land, you can uh, obscure the location. So you will maintain access to the real lat long, but nobody else uh, can have access to that. And if you're someone who submits data to CNDDB, the California Natural Diversity Database, which is run by the state, uh, and you want CNDDB to have access to your exact lat long, you can give them access even if you are obscuring your location. So you can allow yourself, obviously, and then CNDDB access to the real lat long, but nobody else. That was something CNDDB requested that we make available. So we did that. So. Oh, and then, whew, this is getting heavy here. Don't get overwhelmed by the number of words in this slide, but there is such a thing on Calflora as customized data collection forms. And if you're someone who's a rare plant data collector and who submits your data to, to CNDDB, they want you to use their customized data collection form and fill in as many fields as you can. Um, you know, obviously you might not get to all of them. It's a lot of fields. Observer, plant name, date, and location are mandatory, even if it's obscured. Everything else like radius, if it's a polygon or a point with a radius, location description, habitat, aspect, slope, site con condition and population viability, all these other fields are optional, but CNDDB really appreciates it. Um, and it is reliant on CDFW staff, staff to process the data. They don't want it all. I mean, they could have it. It could be automatically given to them. We could push it, but they want to pull it because they have their special way of, of, I think they do a species at a time and they have a certain amount of time that they spend looking at one species and then move on to the next one. So they have their way and that's what they do. Um, okay, so let me just jump back, escape. I hope you guys can still see my screen. The plant ID help group, if you'd like help identifying plants, if you want to add photos into the Calflora database, you go to My Calflora, and then these are all the things that belong to you once you're in the system. My shapes, my plant lists, my email alerts, my searches, my preferences, my comments, or other people's comments on my observations, my groups, my profile, my observations, so go into groups. And then join another group and you can join this group, Plant ID Help. Um, and then there's a lot of different interest groups. You know, you could join um, CNPS, San Diego Seed and Bulb Team, Crystal Cove State Park Team, Early Detection Network, Friends of Five Creek. You know, all these are open groups. There's also such a thing as a closed group, which you wouldn't be allowed to join. But if you're if you have a special interest, you can start your own group. Here's Mount Lassen CNPS chapter, or you can um, you know join a group that already exists. And the main purpose of other than the Plant ID Help group, the purpose of groups is to share private or unpublished or obscure data within a group so other people can see it and see the real information. Now, aspect and slope, Donna, just means it's kind of about the location, like how steep is it and stuff like that. Um, okay, and then, so that's Plant ID Help Group. Any questions about Plant ID Help Group? All right, let's look at, back to the homepage, adding observations, which is what I'd really like all of you to do. 
add observations. There's a lot of different ways to do it. We're going to go over survey checklist entry at the very, very end, which will be actually in about eight minutes. Um, multiple photo upload. So add photos. And then you find on your computer somewhere um, some photos. Let's see. And then you just pull them in. So actually, I happen to have some in my sheet file folder, I think. Oh, gosh. Let me just see here. Well, we can just pull them in from the desktop. Here we go. All right. And this species is not geotagged, so the globe is red. If it were coming from my phone, it would probably have a location embedded in it. And then I wouldn't need to go and say where exactly I saw the species. This isn't actually my photo, so um, it's just a sample here. So let's say that's where I was and it pulls in that location. And then if you know the species, you can write it. I think this is some sort of allium. Mm -hmm. I'll write allium. And it'll take it at the genus level. You can also just say, oops, you can just say unknown. And then you say upload observation. You're not quite done. Click here to publish your new observation so others can see it. So you go here, here it is, unpublished allium. Oh, that's interesting. That's not today. So the date was embedded in the photo, the location I picked, but the date came, came from the EXO file. Um, and then here I can edit it publish it, delete it. And if you go into editor, um, you can add it to a group. You can obscure it here, which we talked about earlier. And you can change your uh, data collection form to have more questions or fewer questions, et cetera, and save it. And then everybody can see it now, but the location is obscured. And the location is actually wrong. So I think I'm going to keep this unpublished because I don't, I don't, it's not even my photo. Any questions about adding photos to Calflora? Uh, there were a couple uh, that came earlier. Uh, somebody said that uh, when they added their photos, uh, they wound up upside that when they add some photos from their phone, some of them wind up floating sideways or upside down. Mm -hmm. Can you tip that? Um, that you can just take it upside down. And then when you're in edit mode, go in here and say rotate clockwise or counterclockwise mm -hmm. or whatever direction, just change it later. I don't know why it, why it would upload upside down, but it's easy to change. And I've lost the I've lost the chat. So if you could tell me what else is in yeah, the chat, exactly. I don't know where it went. And then okay. another another question is um, I think you're going to be talking about um, iNaturalist later. Um, is that when you'll talk about uh, the answer to somebody's question here? If we already upload photos to iNaturalist, is it necessary or desirable to also upload to Calflora? How do they relate? Will you let's, talk about it later or um, talk about it here? Let's talk about it now. This is a great segue into iNaturalist. So let's go back to the homepage, add observations. And one of the ways to add observations is add records from iNaturalist. So does anybody want to type their iNaturalist handle into the chat? It's an interactive. Get one. Thanks, Dave. I see you now. Okay, Sapien Shane. Oh, that's right. I've looked at Shane so far. So Sapien Shane. Take this off. Search. Oh, gosh. I need to turn mute somebody. Hold on. Oh, God. Uh, mute, mute, mute. Somebody has their TV on, huh? Where is the mute for that person? Oh, I think I accidentally muted Shane. Sorry, Shane. Um, all right. Well, I don't hear the I don't hear the TV. So, here are Shane's iNat observations. And Shane, do you want to? Sorry, I muted you. Do you want to unmute yourself and 
let's see. We could look at this one. And if you want to add it to Cal, oh, location obscurity cannot add to Calflora. Huh. I actually haven't seen that before. Good to know. This one, we could, that's a nice photo. We could add to Calflora, but regarding the photo questions, so we can add that. Now it's in Calflora. We can see the details over on the iNaturalist page for that observation. Um, if we wanted to use this, show, this photo as a reference photo on a taxon report page, we would have to ask Shane to put it into Calflora as a native Calflora native observation. So we couldn't get it from here. We could like it though. That is a great photo. And if you want to search iNaturalist observations without somebody's handle, you could just, um, let's turn on your chapter. And then we can choose, let's see, there's still Shane's observations. Let's look at, is there a specific species you guys are interested in, in, your, in that might grow in your chapter area that we need more of in Calflora? What about the spiria, the first one showing? Spiria, okay. Can add that one. Oh, you're saying to look it up here. Spy. And as you start typing, there's this drop down. So thank goodness. Whew, you don't really have to know how to spell oh. that. Search. Oh, it's hanging. That area might be too big. Four hundred and nineteen spirea in. Oh, I didn't say in map area. That's why it took so long. So that's in the whole state. Yeah. So if we were just looking in Redbud, it looks like there's a couple on the very edge of Redbud. Kim Baldwin, I can add that one. So that's how you add INOT um, to Calflora. And you can do it for your own records. You can do it for somebody else's records. Um, however, however that works, you want to you can do it that way. And plant ID group we talked about, upload photo, illustrated plant list. I showed you one of those map layers. I showed you nursery information, nursery availability. I showed you tolerances, plant characteristics. So it's eight o'clock. I think I got through everything that I said I was gonna talk about. Did I miss something? Okay, so next I'm just gonna go, unless there's any other questions about what I've already talked about, it's time to talk about entering your chapter checklist in Decalflora. Let's so. talk about, I, I wanted to ask, get a couple of questions out there. Uh -huh. um, is there a maximum number of photos per observation? Oh, right, I saw that and I forget, that's a good question. No, you can have 100 observation, 100 photos per observation and without, like there is no limit. I mean, it might take you, take the system a while to get them in when you clicked on upload. So if you went here to add observations, multiple photo upload, and you, you added a couple or like a hundred, um, and then you clicked upload, it would take, it would churn for a while, but no, there's no limit. And what is an observation per se? It, 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 yeah. What defines an observation? Um, that is, why can I not click on that tab? That's weird. Oh, because I have this open. Um, observations are defined as any one species at one location, even if it's a polygon. So for instance, in map area search here, each of these like this is one observation. Jacob might have multiple photos associated. Gosh, that's beautiful. Um, wow. He doesn't actually have multiple photos, but this is saying he saw this nemocladus at this location in Fresno and had a lot to say about the location description and the notes. That is one observation. Everything on this list, let me just fold up the map. So 28 records I found in this area when I just did a search in this map area for any species, any native status, any start date, any end date, any observer, any location description with or without photos, um, I got 28 records. Now you can sort those by clicking on here and then they sort by, they sort alphabetically. You can sort by observer. Um, you can sort by ID. You can also, if you're wondering like, why don't I see 
a field called um, distribution, because I think I should, because I know that this person put distribution in, in their data collection form. You can add anything else into your column set. So error radius, you can include um, genus. Well, genus is already in there, but anyway, we'll have genus all by itself. Habitat, let's add that. Uh, percent cover can be interesting. Phenology, ooh, I like that one, phenology. So anyway, all these are choices you can apply and add them and now let's fold up the map again. Um, you can see which observations have an error radius, a habitat, a percent cover. It's not actually that many, but when it's there, it shows up in your results. And then this little plus seven means that um, this person has seven or even eight total photos for this. Wow, this is beautiful. Oh my goodness. It's so easy to just get lost in these photos. Um, so that does that answer your question about what is an observation? It does. Uh, Ray Lynn asks, so when you add a photo from your phone, does it automatically add the GPS coordinates? And, yes. And that, that's accurate? Yeah, if you're under canopy or in a canyon, um, it, it will be a little bit less accurate than if you're at the top of a mountain or in an urban, more urban place. But as you can see on Jacob's observation here, it has high location quality. And if you, I just clicked on location quality to learn more about what that means. And it brought me to this matrix here. Um, so if the quality is high, it's one of these three categories. The radius, the location accuracy radius is less than or equal to 5.6, 44, 76. So that's our categories for um, qualifying as high, medium, or low location accuracy. Does that answer your question? Probably. We'll oh, it wasn't yours. That's right. It was, yeah, it was Yeah. Yeah. I think I was going to show you guys also um, how to learn more about the map layers. It's if you're in another layers, thing, Cynthia would be yeah. comments and oh, yeah, communicating comments. with other observers. Right. Okay. So here, if you're wondering about the map layers, here's all about the map layers, where they come from, how we got them, what we do with them. And then to make a comment, yeah, that's fine. My LM is not actually very important in that case. Um, you can go to comments and comments on my observations. Well, that was just a pretend comment. So all comments and um, let people know if you think the idea is questionable or if you like here, this was a good one. So David, here's some comments. Michelle doesn't agree with David's identification. She agrees with Glenn Schneider's. So they both don't think it's woolly milkweed. And then David received an email and will hopefully, hopefully change um, his ID on that one. It seems like there are more options on the computer than on the phone application. The phone app is for collecting data. It's not for, so INAT has Seek and you can use it to help you ID stuff. You can use CalFlora to help you ID things. Um, but the phone app itself is for collecting data. Does that help Carissa? Okay, so any other questions before we get into survey entry? Or yes. Checklist um, entry, yep. Yes, Cynthia, did you say that uh, you need to be a registered uh, contributor to uh, contribute observations? Yep, and you do that in the upper right here of your screen. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Raylan wants to know, in the future, will CalFlora have seek option? I don't know. I mean, if you want to use it on INAT, it's a big deal and it's always changing and being updated and improved and already having a phone app. I don't know. I, it's a good question. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, so I'm going to go to CalFlora, add observations and go to survey checklist entry here. And Hannah and I added a few of them already and I wanted to show you guys how you can add surveys and checklists into CalFlora so that your chapter or you know a group of you, it doesn't have to be from your chapter, can enter 
your surveys and checklists into Calflora, which really enhances the data available um, to everybody using Calflora. So let's go to Redbud, Redbud CNPS, because we entered about three, but there is a lot more. Mm. Local that's floras. The, that, that, yeah, okay. So Boggs Lake, I don't think we did. Oh, that's in Lake County. Do you guys, which one should we do? Three we did. Hannah, I hope you're here to remember which three we did. I can figure it out. Well, that's an old website, but that works. <laughs> yes. Oh, should I go? It's, Where's it, the new no, website? It's the old website, but the floors are still on the old website. It's the one, it's the one exception to the rule. <laughs> so you've done well. <laughs> uh, okay. I believe we did Sage Hen. Yeah. Uh, Health Half Acre. Yeah, and Rock Creek, right? Exactly. So do you guys want to do Independence Trail, Placer Nature Center, Buttermilk, In Boggs, Auburn? Independence Trail sounds good. Okay. So here, oh great, this looks amazing. Look at this plant list. Chapter put together. Let's see if there's a date on it. Yeah, 2006. Good. And then we'll credit the Red Bud chapter of the California Native Plant Society. So let's go back here, a new record. We'll say observer, it automatically puts in my name, um, but I'll just change that as the observer. And then the name of the list is this so copy and paste that in the one thing we actually already have that checklist oh no i should have done that first okay all right do you think it's changed or do you think it's exactly this one well you, you could edit it yeah um, okay so let's turn on the re that's a good thing so check first and see what checklists are already in calflora from your chapter so here we are in red bud i turned on Include surveys and checklists in selected area. Should I put in observer CNPS or not necessarily, not necessarily? Ooh, it's gonna be a lot. I shouldn't have done that. Cause this is like from all time. Oh yeah, it's really a lot. Here, let me paste something in to chat. Try, okay. try this. So th this is checklists that have independence somewhere in <clears throat> in their name. Oh, that's a good idea. You could also look up SV. If I sort it by um, ID, all the surveys are going to be SVY, but okay, independence, right? So John pasted in. I would open it up in a new tab. Yep. Can I mention something about these checklists? Sure. So I think it's uh, really important that folks actually put in like who observed the species and what date it was from, whether uh -huh. or not historic record. Because mm -hmm. sometimes if you just have like CNPS and you observed it, like you put that data in, like last month, it kind of almost seems like, oh, a CNPS member saw this last month, but it could have been right. like 60, which is right. Significant. And we would put in the date. So if I, if John wasn't here and I didn't realize it was already in Calflora, I would put in 2006 um, as the observation date. That's why I was glad to see that on there. But that's a very good point. So here, here it is, right? 2006, Redbud CNPS. Let's go to the editor and plant list so 85 records let's see how many let's see how many oh this is this looks like more than 85 doesn't it copy and this is the fun things that you guys will get to do as a chapter if you decide you want to take something like this on so how many is that nope there's more okay so 93 so John, do you think it's okay if I just make a new one to show them how? Sure. Okay, good answer. So here we are. We're going to change the date to 2000s. 
six oh one oh one because we don't know when it was um and then i'll just copy and paste from that from here all of them and it's amazing how the system takes these scientific names and digests them and then tells me which ones are rejected because they were misspelled or because they're family. Like we don't need the family like that, but there will be some that are um, misspelled that you can go through and say, huh, like this one, how, how is that supposed to be spelled? And you can go and, um, Okay, so here, is that spelled differently? Can't even tell. Copy, paste, add. Yes, added one. Okay, so there was some little typo with that one and I fixed it by just Googling how to spell it. And you could go through all of these that are supposedly misspelled and figure out what exactly, is there a letter missing? What's going on with that? And then, um, but this is just a demo. So I'll leave it with the 78. And then we have to find the location. So South Yuba River State Park. This is a little trick that I do to find the location. I go to the California homepage, what grows here, where you can actually type in a location name. And what do you know, this one's on here. And then uh, we could search and see what grows at the state park, which is looks like a lot. But I just take the lot long out of there and then come back to survey entry and go to point location and enter those coordinates in apply. Let's see if it takes me there. Right. Let's turn on layers. Oh, they are on. Huh. So where exactly is it on one side or the other of the river? Do you guys know? Yeah. So try, I'll just try clicking those colored things and see, and see what turns up. BLM. It, it, trails on both the north it, and south side. Yeah, it, it's mostly on the, uh, what is that? Feels like the- It's on both sides. Yeah, it's on both sides. So it's my this, backyard. Oh, okay. that sounds lovely. So it, South Yuba River State Park supposedly is this green pastel thing here on both mm -hmm. sides of the river yeah. going north south. Yeah. Does but that's that the wrong location. Go down river. Oh here? Oh see yeah, where, that's it. See too. where 49 crosses? Yeah. yeah. That's Independence Trail above it. To the south. Oh, like right here? You're to the left. Yeah. And down. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Right along okay. 49. Okay. Mm. Oh, like there. There? Right. It was okay. in the Jones fire. Oh, wow. The reason it's called Independence Trail is because it's accessible. I see. So you can be independent yes, on it. Yes. Okay, so I'm just gonna draw a polygon around this trail. Something like that. Is that sort of what you guys are talking about? Move the top over to the right okay. along 49. Oh, right, 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 okay. Okay, somewhere like that-ish? Yeah, that'll do. Okay, and if you guys decide to take this on, you can edit this survey, you, I can give it to you, you can junk it and redo it whatever you want. And then let's move the point over to inside our polygon. Okay. So I also want to include this in here so that somebody could go back and under record detail and figure out um, where this all came from. And we'll say CNPS red bud. The ownership is state park right right state government it's public access wild oh you could add photos here if you had some if you wanted to you don't have to and so where was my what grows here for this area here we are what is also fun thing to do is let's see if we can find this exact area 
in what grows here before we save it we can see how many species well since this is a duplicated checklist it probably won't change that much but let's say in selected area how many do we get and what grows here turn that off so 325 and since it's a lot of duplicated from the checklist it was or the survey is already in cal flora it might not change that much when we save this let's just see save that and then go back over here and search again. So 325 might change. 326. <laughs> so one species was not a duplicate from the other checklist is what that's telling me. But when you guys do uh, checklists that are not in CalFlora at all, there'll be even be there will be any overlap and it'll be a big boost to what's available in CalFlora for your um, checklist areas. Does that make sense as like a purpose and why you might do that? And how also? like how you enter surveys and why they're important. And Hannah, your question about the date, did you have another, did you wanna say anything else about that? No, I think that I covered everything. Okay. Are there a lot of um, chapter or not, are the people interested in doing this and banding together and, and you know, take, dividing them up? Cause there's more than what's on your, um, website, I think. And there's probably some who have their own, their own checklists on their own, you know, handwritten or on their own computers and stuff. Oh, yeah. Be there, there, I'm sure there's so many. And I know that you mentioned that it's really important and more helpful for localized floras and checklists rather yeah. than the county. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so two questions that just came through. Alina said, what if I forget this by the time I want to do it? Great question. Under tools, there's a video and it's me um, doing something really similar to what I just did. And you can watch the video. It's like two minutes long and you can refresh your memory that way. And then Matthew asks, are surveys supposed to be comprehensive or is it okay to do a survey that doesn't capture every species? Absolutely does not have to be comprehensive. Even if you just have three or four or 10 species in an area, great, you know, that's better than none. Um, and as you visit again and again and again, you can update your checklist and improve it and make it bigger and better and longer and maybe omit things if you realize you misidentified something in the past like that. So here's a question. If say we went on, say, say we uh, went on a hike and we developed a checklist, uh, and then uh, we told the people who went on the hike, hey, you know, we're going to upload this checklist. And then am I right that this turns out to be a pretty um, efficient way uh, for then those plant species, if those plant species are not necessarily recorded as being in the county for people to be able to upload their observations because there's already a geotag uh, for, you know, for where they were? Or is it that they would still geotag their specific, um, oh. their specific observation within that, uh, with, within that, you know this yeah so there are two different sets of data one is here's a survey and it's within this larger geographic area and the mm -hmm. other is here's the specific place where it took this photograph mm -hmm. yeah i think i think what you're asking is what if you went back and you found a point of the arrow and the arrow was you know right here not right. exactly you could either just leave it because it's already in the survey and that's great. Or you could add it as a point location in CalFlora using your using Observer Pro. Like there's no really wrong way to do it. It's a little more accurate in terms of location to do a point of the arrow, even if it's already in the survey. Um, so someone else could go and find it later. But if you would rather just, you know, check off a hundred plants off your list and add them all at once in a survey um, instead of having a hundred different points at different locations, you can do that. If you do have a hundred points at a hundred different locations and you happen to have a spreadsheet with a lat long, we do have a way to enter spreadsheets with lat longs and different species at every lat long into CalFlora also. And that we could, I'd be happy to go over later, like, you know, another day. Yeah. 
One other thing is that um, a checklist can have specific observations in it. So what some people do is they go out on a day and take a whole bunch of observations with the phone app and then take all of those and add them to see how there's an observations tab that we're seeing. So, so you'd add all those observations that you made on that day and, and it would automatically make a checklist out of it. <laughs> that is so complicated. It's so it, cool it, it, and it, so it's complicated. Really, it's, it's like, it's like something where you want both. Yeah. You know? there, yeah. There are agencies that want both. So. Yeah. Um, and you can, Oh, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say you can add one at a time, one plant at a time. If you like, if you come back later and you just see one thing and as you start to type again, there's that drop down to help you with your spelling. So you don't misspell it. Um, or if you went out and saw a whole bunch, you could just paste it in here like we did before. Okay. What was your question? So that's adding it to the survey, correct? Yes, adding okay. it to the survey. And if you wanted to, like Donna was saying, um, just add a photo, you know, I just go to the homepage, add observations. What we're just doing is entering a survey or a checklist. You can enter multiple photos or one photo here and just pull it in. You can pull it in from your computer, from your phone, wherever you want and add it that way. So you, that's, adding an, that's adding a point observation instead of a survey just to refresh your memory and all these applications have little videos under tools and help so the um here under help there's a video here there's also a video right below it because people weren't finding the video so we just put it below here on how to do it if you go to oh um, maybe you go to observation search oh i can't remember how she said i'm supposed to do this the video here under help tools there's lots of information under help about what is every, how do I draw a polygon? What is the CPAD thing? Lots of reading. Carissa has a question. Do the plant lists add to the overall observations or do they remain as plant lists only? It depends on how you mean add to overall observations. So in what grows here, what we were looking at when this number changed to 326, those that was a species that showed up in this area that hadn't been here before. So in that sense, it adds to the overall observations. It's still embedded in a plant list, whatever that one species was that wasn't here before. It, say checklist because plant oh, lists sorry. are really different. Sorry, 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 checklist. Sure. So it's still whatever that one species was that wasn't here, it's still part of this checklist. Um, but it is uh, an observation as well. So it's kind of both. Do, do you think so, John? Is that how you would say it? Yeah. So if, if I, if someone had um, listed that plant uh, in a checklist and I lived within 10 miles of the hike that was on or the, look, you know, the polygon where mm -hmm. that place where that checklist was done. Mm -hmm. And then I said, you know, find me all the plants that are within 10 miles of where I live. Mm -hmm. uh, if that new plant that was on a, uh, that was on a checklist, but hadn't otherwise been in California, would that new plant show up as a plant in the search results? You so it did. Would, it, would it be like, hey, that's a native plant I can use? if I want to create a native plant landscape of some type. Oh, would it show up in the planting guide if, it, if someone yes. enters it as a checklist? Yeah. Uh -huh. I don't know, John, what do you think? Well, it, it depends on the location accuracy. I mean, some checklists like transects, some, some of them are for very tight little areas, in which case they're definitely usable. Um, but if it's for like a whole big state park, if you did a checklist for a whole big state park, that probably won't have much impact on the planning guide because the, the location accuracy for any one particular plant is so is going to be low. So for this polygon that we drew, is it so big that it wouldn't these plants wouldn't be incorporated into the planting guide algorithm, or would they be? Uh, I think they wouldn't, but we'd have to see what the area was of that thing. So there's some cutoff. Yeah. And if I really wanted them to be included, I could just shrink my polygon down. Yep. <laughs> Funny workarounds. 
Any other questions? Well, I hope that a group of you is interested in doing this and I'm really happy to help and San Luis Obispo paved the way. Um, and they're also happy to answer questions about how long it took or how many people they had. I think they had about six people. Um, I don't know how long it took, but yeah, it's really valuable. And if you have any other questions, you can contact us. If you, something occurs to you later here on the homepage under contact Calflora. Um, we didn't write it out, but it's sprt at calflora.org. That's our support. And we all, everybody, we both get those um, emails and it really helps to include the hyperlink. So if you had entered, uh, let's see, where is an observation? Some, you had some query that you had a question about, like this one. So then you copy and paste this and you say, but Redbud chapter actually extends a little bit farther east and you know, why isn't Cisco showing up or some, whatever, whatever your question is, then we can say, oh, okay, I see what they're saying and look at your exact query and um, help you that way. So that's how to contact us, or you can write us a letter and call us. This is a voicemail that we check regularly. Um, and thank you very much, Redbud Chapter. You guys ask great questions, and yeah, stay in touch. Hannah, this is Hannah. Mm -hmm. Hi, Hannah. I'm so glad you're here. Oh, God. <laughs> so, Hannah was kind of touch and go for a while about being able to make it tonight. <laughs> Oh no, thank you. thank you so much, Cynthia. I really appreciate you dedicating the time to teach us all about Calflora. I also want to say that Calflora is a nonprofit and they do rely on donations and we all know. <sighs> you know, I meant to mention, we are actually in the middle of our fundraiser and we have t-shirts. So if you donate here, here from the homepage, if you click on donate, and if you want to donate and get a t-shirt, it's 150 or more, and it'll say, do you want a t-shirt or a sweatshirt? You say yes, and then here are, I should, I'm wearing one of them. Here are the t-shirts and sweatshirts to choose from, and you can, um, if you want to donate and get a t-shirt, that's, that's a way to do it. Thanks for mentioning that, Hannah. I forgot about that. Thank you so much, Cynthia, and to everyone at Calflora. We really appreciate you, and Calflora is such a valuable tool. Yeah, thanks you guys and have a good rest of your evening and stay in touch. Stop share. Okay.